Most of us, when we were younger, probably envisioned what our future would look like, had dreams, maybe of our career, our family, things that we would see, places that we would get to go and visit, and things that we would get to do. We have these things in our head and we plan them, but it is not uncommon for life to not go according to plan. So how do we handle it? I mean, how do you plan for getting a serious illness in your life, being diagnosed with that? How do you handle that? How do you handle the loss of something that is very special to all of us? How do you handle the loss of a loved one, maybe a spouse or a child? How do you go on? How do you deal with church problems that just cut to the heart? Things can change. Things don't always go as we plan. What does God want us to do? Well, I'll tell you what. God has given us characters in the Word of God, people whose lives we can look at. And when I think of these type of questions that I've asked, I think of a man by the name of Joseph when life doesn't go as we planned, I think a good place to go is Genesis 37 through 50 and look at the life of a man named Joseph. I just want to sketch a portrait of his life and talk about five different stages of his life and how he handled it. I think he's a good example for us on how to handle these twists and turns and dark days in our lives and our plans change and our life is, is not what we had dreamt it would be. First of all, I think we see in chapters 37 and 38 that the life of Joseph began to unravel and it began to unravel for him at the age of 17. Now, can you imagine? I don't think I'd had to face many difficulties at the age of 17. I hadn't learned much in life, really. But at the age of 17, we, we see that things began to unravel for him. Now, things started out pretty good in his favor. In fact, he was the favorite son of his father, Jacob. But his brothers despised him. This hatred really is brought to a peak when Joseph starts having dreams that picture his brother's and his father bowing down before him. In fact, if you look in 37.10, even his father rebuked Joseph for these dreams and suggested, suggesting that they would bow down to him and questioning that. So they were pretty upset, his brothers. And one day, when the brothers were caring for the flocks, Joseph is sent by his father to see how they are doing. But when the brothers saw Joseph coming, they conspired to kill him. Well, except for Reuben. He rejects this idea and tells the brothers, let's just throw him into this pit. And he is thinking to himself that he would come back and get Joseph out of that pit. If you look in 37 verses 21 and 22. While in the pit, Judah comes up with the idea to sell him to the Midianite traders who were passing by, and they do that. Hey, if you're going to do something evil, you might as well profit from it, right? So they do that, and Joseph is taken to Egypt. We see that the, the brothers put blood on the coat of Joseph, and they bring it back to their father Jacob, and Jacob then believes that a fierce animal had torn Joseph to pieces. You see the evil here. Making their dear father believe that Joseph is dead. In chapter 38, you might say, well, what's the relevance of that? But it's an important piece to the life of Joseph that we need not overlook. We don't need to skip it. In chapter 38, 
it just reveals what a terrible person Joseph's brother Judah truly is. Remember that it was his idea to sell Joseph because killing Joseph had no financial gain. Judah sleeps with prostitutes here in this chapter 38 and he, uh, this, this information is really going to be relevant toward the end of Joseph's life, but just keep that in mind. The next stage I want to consider in the life of Joseph is in chapter 39 and it goes from bad to worse. Has that ever happened to you? Things are going bad, it seems like nothing's going right and it just gets worse. This is certainly what happened to Joseph. It's bad enough that his brothers hated him so much that they sold him into slavery. He, he was taken away from his homeland into a foreign land. And he didn't even know of it for sure, but his, his father thought he was dead. And just imagine your siblings hating you that much. You think your brothers and sisters do not like you. This is a very strong hatred towards Joseph and when Joseph was brought to Egypt, he was put into service in the household of Potiphar, who was an officer for Pharaoh and captain of the guard. And you would think that God must have something against this man named Joseph. What has he done that is so wrong? What is this happening, happening to him? But if you look at chapter 39 and verse 2, look at these words. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with him. It certainly doesn't look like it at this time, does it? It doesn't look like it to Joseph probably at this time either, what was happening to him. But the Lord was with Joseph, and the Lord caused him to be successful in Potiphar's house. But Potiphar's wife, we see that Joseph catches her attention. He's a handsome man, we know that. And she tries to seduce him. Day after day, Joseph refuses to do that, you see, in chapter 39 and verse 10. So many good lessons there for us. He refuses to get involved in this. But one day, she called him by his garment and told him to sleep with her. He leaves... And her, his garment stays in her reach, her hand, and he runs out the house. Now rather than taking this rejection well, she calls the men of the house and says that he tried to rape her and ran away when she screamed. You see that in verses 14 and 15. So when Potiphar, her husband, hears this accusation against Joseph. He throws Joseph into prison. And that's where the king's prisoners are kept. So life has just gone from really bad to worse. But I want you to look at the words of verse 21 there in chapter 39. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of of the keeper of the prison. The next phase in chapter 40, I've called uh, the rug getting pulled out from under you. You would think that things couldn't get any worse. I mean, he's stuck in an Egyptian prison. But Pharaoh, we see in the meantime, he gets angry with two of his officials, with the chief butler and the chief baker. And he puts them in the same prison that he's put Joseph in. We see in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 40. One night in the prison, both of these men, the chief butler and the chief baker, they have, have dreams and no one can interpret them. But we see that Joseph says that God can interpret dreams. And for them to tell him what they dreamed in verse 8. And the chief butler indicated uh, what his dream was. And the dream indicated, according to Joseph, that in three days, Pharaoh was going to bring him back to his position 
before Pharaoh. Joseph begs the cupbearer to remember him, this butler, this chief butler, when he returns to Pharaoh in three days. You remember me. You see, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Here's my way out. I've interpreted his dream. When this comes true, he can mention me to Pharaoh and I can get out of here. Well, the chief baker, his dream wasn't so good, at least his interpretation. His dream was that in three days, Pharaoh was going to lift him up on a tree and hang him. And in three days, both of these interpretations of their dreams came true. We see that the chief butler was given his previous position as the cupbearer to Pharaoh. And we see that the chief baker was killed. He was put to death. Now, if you're Joseph, you're probably thinking, okay, any day they're going to come and they're going to release me. I'm out of here. My ticket's punched. Any day they're going to come and, and they're going to take me away from this place. Look at verse 23. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Forgot him. He did not forget him just for a day, just for a week, just for a month. But if you look at the first verse in chapter 41, he forgot him for two whole years. Now, how does this happen? You're going through these difficulties, these days of darkness, but there's a glimmer of hope, and you get your hopes up, and then it doesn't come to be. How do you think this impacted the thinking of Joseph? When you have a little hope and it vanishes away and all this time's going by and they don't come to free you. The rug is pulled out from under you. In the fourth section in chapters 41 through 45 of Genesis is out of the pit. Pharaoh begins to have dreams and no one's able to interpret his dreams and finally the chief butler, the cupbearer, all of a sudden his memory comes back to him and he remembers this man by the name of Joseph that he met in prison and was able to interpret his dream and did so accurately. So they clean up Joseph and they put him before Pharaoh to listen to the interpretation of his dream. And Joseph makes it clear, and I, I respect this so much about Joseph, that he is not the one that's able to interpret these dreams, but his God is there, you see in 41, 16. Pharaoh's dream, you know this, you've studied it since you were a child. There would be a time, a period of seven years of plenty. And it's a time that they need to be preparing because what's coming after that is a time of famine, a time of little. So they need to be storing up for seven years so they can make it through the famine. Now it's important to see where Joseph is at his life at this point. How old do you think he is? Man, he's been through a lot, hasn't he? Well, Stevie must be as old as you. He's only 30. 30 years old. But things are getting better to some degree. Uh, he marries an Egyptian woman. And they have two children. The first child, he is named Manasseh. Notice why in verse 51 of chapter 41 that Joseph calls him this. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God has made me forget all my toil, toil and all my father's house. Those things in the past, God's made me forget that. So I'm going to use this name that means that, Manasseh. That's my first son. 
Well, the second child is named Ephraim. Look at verse 52, why the second child is named Ephraim. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So the point is to say, forget my family, forget my past. God has made me fruitful here and That's what I'm going to focus on now. So the famine causes Joseph's brothers to need to come from Canaan to Egypt to buy grain. When Joseph sees them, he recognizes them, but they do not recognize him. The first thing that Joseph does is call them spies and throws them in prison for three days. If you look at chapter 42... Verses 16 and 17. He accuses them of being spies and they are thrown into prison for three days. Now you think this is a little payback, maybe? I don't know. But after three days, he tells them to go back and to to bring the youngest brother next time. So that he can know that they are telling the truth and that they are not spies. So not only this, one of the brothers is going to have to stay behind uh, until they return. Maybe that's like a bell. I don't know. But they're holding, they're holding that son to, to, uh, to try to, that brother, to try to get them to come back. Reuben is then telling the brothers that this is happening because they did not listen to him when he told them not to hurt Joseph over 13 years ago. Can you imagine that? So Joseph hears this, and they don't know uh, that he hears this. But he goes off and he, he mourns, he cries, and then he comes back and he imprisons Simeon, the second oldest, not Reuben, the oldest, uh, who had tried to, who was thinking in his head he was going to rescue him. So the other brothers return to Canaan. But the famine continues to last and they have to return for more food but they can only come back if they bring Benjamin the youngest so they come back they come back and Simeon is released on their arrival and Joseph sends them back for more grain with a plan Joseph has his silver cup put in Benjamin's sack thinking that uh, the brothers will betray him just like they did Joseph, but they don't. They all come back, and they plead for the life of Benjamin, and they tell Joseph that you cannot kill him because their father had two sons with one mother, and the father believes that the first was torn in pieces, and he could not live with the thought of losing his other son. And amazingly here, we see that it is Judah, that brother that you think is the worst, perhaps. It's Judah who offers his life for Benjamin's. So with all of this, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers and he instructs the whole family to move to Egypt where they can be provided for during this severe famine. So the last section, chapters 46 through 50, the end of the book of Genesis, we see the wisdom of Joseph in the end. All of this is set up to the big point Joseph comes to understand at the end that all of these hardships that he has suffered, all these traumatic experiences that he's had in his life, He comes to understand them. The brothers, they're worried when they realize who he is. They are fearful fearful for their lives. And we see the father, Jacob, dies. And uh, all of them are more afraid that there's going to be severe punishment and retribution for what uh, they have done to Joseph. But Joseph, I want you to notice... What he says in Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 through 21. Turn there, Genesis chapter 50. 
Let's read together verses 19 through 21. Do not be afraid, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. A couple of things I want to make from what Joseph says in these verses. And that is, he says, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Joseph is not going to make them pay or punish them because it's not his job. He understands that vengeance does not belong to him. It is not for him to try to get back for what they have done. To bring them harm because they have harmed him so and changed his entire course of life. That is spiritual wisdom right there, friends. If we could just understand that. As Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, that vengeance is not ours. And he says there in Romans 12 and verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Now I want you to realize at this time, Joseph in Egypt, he's moved up through the ranks. If I understand it correctly, he's the second most powerful person in Egypt. Can you imagine that? This Israelite? How does that happen? How do, you, how do you move up the ranks? How are you that successful being a foreigner and coming to this land and be put in prison? How do you move up like that? How do you become the second most powerful person in Egypt? Because God was with him, remember that. Now I would imagine the second most powerful man in Egypt could have unleashed wrath upon his brothers that sold him into slavery and led their father to believe that he was dead. I would say that all he had to say was the word, and they'd be put to death right there. No, no questions asked, but he doesn't. Because he realizes it is not his job. And when we read Romans chapter 12, where it says that we're not to repay evil with evil, but we're to be good. And Jesus taught in his Sermon on the Mount that we're to pray for our enemies. And that's not easy, is it? You think about someone that's changed the course of your life for a bad way. How do you pray for them? For their good. How do you do that? Joseph is a man of integrity. He is a godly man. He's not looking for any loopholes to try to, to go around this. He realizes that vengeance belongs to God. Oh, if we could just realize this ourselves. And not only does he not bring punishment to them, he comforts them and speaks kindly to them. You see in chapter 50 and verse 21. Notice something else about what Joseph says here. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Now I want you to just look at that statement in your Bible and let that sink into your heart. What is God telling us here? God is telling us just because your life is not going as you had planned, it doesn't mean that it's not going according to His plan. What others mean for evil, God can mean for good. Look in Genesis chapter 45. I want to read to you verses 4 through 8 of Genesis 45. This is what Joseph said earlier 
to his brothers. Genesis 45, beginning in verse 4, And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, uh, for these two years the famine has been in the land. And there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made a father to Pharaoh. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and a ruler of throughout all the land of Egypt. You hear what Joseph is saying? It was not you who sent me here. I don't want you to think that. But God sent me here. He's not ignoring the evil that they've done, what these brothers have done to him, but he says, because he says there, you sold me into Egypt. But he understands that God had another purpose for him. God meant it for good. How do we know that God can take evil and use it for good? Well, the best example that I can give you of God taking something evil and turning it into something good is looking at the cross of Jesus Christ, His Son. The Roman leaders and the leaders of God's own chosen people, the Israelites, the Hebrew people, meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And you think about Judas, one of the twelve, one that Jesus had selected. He meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Did it look like it at the moment that Jesus was hanging on the cross with blood dripping down and pooling at the foot of the cross? No, not at all. But in the end, we can see God works together to bring good out of this. And I'm reminded of Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 that God turns things out for good. So I ask you this evening, when life doesn't go as you plan and you run into some heartbreaking, earth-shattering experiences in your life, What are you going to do? Are you going to give up on life? Are you going to take your life? Are you going to quit the church? Turn your back on the Lord? Say, I didn't sign up for this. I become a child of God. I try to do what's right and this is what I get in return. Are you going to turn your back on people? Someone that has hurt you? Are you going to try to hurt them worse than they've hurt you? What you need to do is what Joseph did and give God the glory and treat people kindly and keep pressing on. You know, here's his brothers in fear, shaking in their boots, and they should have been. And he treats them kindly and comforts them. Do you know the comfort that you can give to other people? Because of something you've had to experience in the past and they're going through it right now. You can comfort them. You can show them that God has helped you through it. And the best advice I can give to you is draw as close to God as you can get. You tie a knot in the rope of faith and you hang on with all your life. You study people like Job. You study people like Joseph. And you see how they endured the hardships. You look at the life of the Apostle Paul. And you see how he learned to be content in whatever state he was in. Because they're focused on something better. Let's say your life goes even better than you dreamed when you were young. Let's say you you never dreamed you would have as much as you have now. 
and you feel so blessed. But do those things alone satisfy? Are you going to give your soul in exchange to have more and more of those things, earthly things, temporary things? That's a bad decision. Whatever state we're in, maybe we've had an easy life, maybe we've had a very, very difficult one, and it's getting more difficult. Draw closer to God. You get as close as you can get to Him, and you hang on to your hope and faith and love for God and His church. And you help people. Joseph is one of my heroes in the Bible. There we find him at the end of the first book of the Bible. And there's so many lessons that we can learn from his life. What wisdom he gained. And he went through the school of hard knocks. But I'd say he got a Ph.D., And I believe that he's not in prison any longer. You know, this morning, we were talking about the grace of God. God wants to save us and has gone to a great expense of pain and heartache and given his son so that you can be saved. And that's his grace. But it requires you to respond. I was thinking on the way home from the service this morning. There's got to be a good way to illustrate what's on my mind about grace. And I was thinking, what if, what if I was thrown in a pit, a lion's den, and there is a roaring lion walking around, looking at me, mouth dripping, teeth that could devour me so quickly. And all of a sudden, a ladder comes down in that pit. A ladder that reaches all the way to the top. That ladder is the grace of God. But it's up to you to get on it and get out of the pit. God wants to save you. Do you want to save yourself? He has done his part. Have you done yours? Don't leave here this evening in a lost condition. Come to Him if you need to while together we stand and sing.